Alright, for a lot of respected people's time, I think we might get started here. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, my name is Justin Park. I attended the International Space University Master's Program in Strasbourg, France. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the International Space University is a school that is focused on the three I's, which is international, interdisciplinary, intercultural. Uh, they have these wonderful uh, intercultural nights where people get to get up and talk about their countries and you learn a lot about the rest of the world. Uh, they have a summer session program that moves around country to country every year. This year it was down in Houston, Texas at Rice University. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I actually got a chance to go down for the alumni weekend uh, where they took us over to Space Center Houston and they had a big panel with all of the lunar landing companies on uh, one of the managers of on the clips program and so yeah i highly recommend uh, checking out the international space university they have scholarships available uh, really helps plug you into the space community if you're looking to work in this uh, industry so tonight um i I'll, i'm talking uh, you know like most of you probably read my bio um isu really was the thing that plugged me into the space community uh, I found the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, and I got my foot in the door. I did my uh, internship at the NASA Ames Research Center uh, back when Pete Warden was still there. Um, been doing, yeah, uh, a lot in the space industry since that time. I've spoke at uh, Satellite, uh, the conference that's in DC every year. I spoke there a couple of times. Uh, and when I was at a uh, new space conference in Seattle, Washington. Uh, there was a, a speaker slash sponsor there, uh, Pablo, um, Pablo Mancada. He, uh, yeah, created Moondow. And Moondow uh, is a Web3 organization. Uh, Web3 is, so Web1 was just static, uh, you know, HTML, a very early infancy of the internet. Um, you know, basic graphics and things like that. Web 2 was more like Facebook and MySpace, uh, where the websites present content that people create, where you upload images and you upload content where, yeah, Web 1 was just a page. Web 2 is where people are starting to contribute. Web 3 uh, is more of a decentralized um, consensus type of, of system where anybody can can contribute and uh, yeah where web one and web two the information was held on a central server or um, location where everybody was going to the same computer uh, web three the information is spread out over lots and lots of computers it's decentralized it's um, uses uh, a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing mechanism where everybody kind of uh, is, is sharing the information in a consensus building way that makes it uh, much harder to compromise. Uh, in order to compromise a Web3 you know, database, because they don't have databases in Web3, or at least not in the traditional sense, uh, with, with Web3 the information is spread out over lots and lots of different uh, nodes what you call them. And so, yeah, one of the useful things uh, that emerged out of this Web3 was uh, the blockchain, where people keep track of transactions uh, between addresses, and you can have something like Bitcoin or one of the other thousands of other tokens where you can keep track of that public ledger of, of who has, which address has how many tokens. Um, I did talk about the blockchain at one of these events uh, maybe five years ago uh, when Angela used to run the events. And so, yeah, I uh, talked, I won't go too much into the blockchain and um, mining and things like that. It's a uh, interesting area of computer science and it's uh, getting better. There's smart contracts or something that have emerged over the years. Uh, smart contracts are um, a, 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 a protocol, a list of procedures that people all kind of agree upon. 
and that way you can create mechanisms for conducting voting. Um, you can create multi-signature contracts so that in order for some person over here to get paid, you have to have at least five of the seven signatures, you know, sign that contract before the funds get released. Um, and then, the, yeah, the voting mechanism is very important. It's been very important to Moondow because we uh, put uh, different proposals up on uh, Snapshot is the name of the service that we use, but there are other voting platforms where, yeah, the number of tokens that you hold allows you to have more influence on the vote. It's kind of like a cross between being a shareholder and being a voter for um, a political race. And we do actually have um, political races within Moondow. We just voted on our uh, second uh, president of the organization. Uh, Pablo has been running it for many years by himself and he wanted a second executive and so we just voted on our second uh, president and so Ryan is now helping Pablo on a day-to-day -day basis and yeah we uh, were able to raise uh, about eight million dollars with our initial coin offering. Uh, our token is at Bitcoin. We, we call our token Mooney. Mooney? because we all were mooned out and we want to create decentralized access to the moon. And it kind of sounds like money, so it's funny. Uh, and so, yeah, when we offered this Mooney token, um, lots of people from all over the world put money in. Uh, it was right after um, uh, a similar um, endeavor to pool a bunch of money to buy uh, an original copy of the Constitution. Uh, there was this uh, week where they were able to raise $24 million to uh, bid on uh, Sotheby's, had this auction for this original uh, copy of the Constitution. Unfortunately, because the blockchain is very transparent, because uh, you know it's P2P and everybody's sharing this information so you can see exactly how much money we were able to raise, and so someone kind of came over and was like, I'll bid 24 million and won, right? And they basically outbid the entire community, uh, which was kind of sad, but it did show that we could raise a whole lot of money very quickly through uh, a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so, yeah, all of the funds were returned to the, to the people who had put money in, but then Pablo was actually one of the creators of that moon, of that constitution DAO, uh, movement if you want to call it or project and so he put together a similar thing called moon down and moon was originally going to bid on an asteroid or a meteor that Sotheby's had but instead of doing that they decided um, uh, Blue Origin had just opened up um, their auction for um, tickets to space I don't know if you guys remember originally um, they opened it up to the public, uh, a ticket to go with Jeff Bezos and his brother into space. And that ticket actually went for like $28 million. Um, some uh, guy from the Netherlands, uh, I think won it. And so, yeah, but Blue Origin had additional tickets become available. And so we uh, bought two of those tickets. Um, Moondow is not, uh, legally, I think, allowed to disclose how much we paid. It's kind of like a non-disclosure that the organization signed with Blue Origin. But the beauty of the blockchain is that it's publicly available information. So if you go back and you go down our list, our ledger of how much money we've given to people, you can see the transaction where we paid Blue Origin uh, a couple of million dollars for these two tickets. And so, yeah, we uh, had a vote to see who we wanted to send to space, and we voted for um, this uh, organization called Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect, they do trick shots on YouTube. You guys might have seen some of their videos. They got really famous um, maybe 10 years ago, where one of the guys chucks a basketball from like the fourth floor, fourth story of the stadium, and it goes in the basket. It's like a miraculous shot, and they made you know the head the cover of um, Sports Center or the yeah Sports Center that night, and uh, yeah it really kind of blew up on social media because 
uh, they made this incredible shot. And the guys talk about it. It's a really good podcast. They, yeah, had like six of them. So, you know, he didn't get it on the first try, but after about 100 tries, these guys are talented individuals. But yeah, they uh, do all kinds of crazy trick shots and things. And so they were able to rally their uh, followers to buy Mooney and vote for them for this particular um, ticket. And so they won. And we sent one of the um, the members of this organization, uh, Cody Cotton, into suborbital space, and it was good for it was fun for him. Uh, I know it's a very life altering experience. A lot of people say going into space, you know, you get this overview effect where you look down on Earth, and it changes you from a, a spiritual standpoint, even because you know you recognize just how. Um, peaceful the world is. You don't see the lines that we put on maps. You know, the world just kind of looks like it it gets along from way up there. Um, so when you come down here, that you realize that we have a lot of problems. But um, yeah, it was good for driving lots of people to Moondow, people who are curious about the blockchain, because uh, it's still a relatively new concept, right? Not a lot of people know very much about how it works. It's kind of techy. Uh, same with the internet, the early internet, most people didn't understand it very well, and now everybody kind of takes it for granted. I do think, yeah, we'll take the blockchain and some of the great endeavors that come out of that for granted someday. Who knows, maybe we'll be able to fix the healthcare system with it. I'm not quite sure what direction it'll go, but uh, it does help make things more transparent. Um, so yeah, we just sent our second astronaut into space. Uh, last month, uh, we did a, a raffle, actually. Uh, Dr. Ayman Yahunger, I hope I didn't butcher his name too bad. Uh, he, yeah, uh, bought a couple of raffle tickets and was selected. Um, he uh, was of Iranian descent, but has been in America for many years. He uh, is a doctor um, from the Midwest somewhere. I forgot exactly. But, uh, yeah, he was always wanting to go into space his whole life and so it was kind of like his childhood dream come true and he's been very good for driving people uh, to Moondow as well. He's done a whole bunch of uh, PR uh, in his local community and across the country to help kind of raise awareness also of the accessibility of space, right? Most people don't think about going to space, they don't think it's possible, uh, but it's gradually becoming something that you can do. Space tourism, I think, presents a, a large opportunity. Um, prices have to come down, right? Most people are not going to spend a million dollars to go to space for 10 minutes, but um, yeah, I do hope that it gets cheaper as it becomes more routine and we hopefully will get some kind of um, uh, economies of scale uh, once we make it more common. Um, so yeah, Moondow also chartered uh, a zero-g flight. Um, zero-g flight, they use them to train astronauts, but basically it's a converted um, 747, I think? 757? 727, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, they tear, take out a bunch of the seats and they put pads around the inside of the plane and it kind of does these parabolic arcs. And once you get up at the zenith, uh, you experience weightlessness for about 30 seconds. Uh, it's pretty cool. We did another NFT raffle for that, and my NFT actually got selected. Um, uh, yeah, the process was, a, there were about five or six steps in order to mint this NFT, so only about 19 people were able to figure it out. I was one of those 19 people, so it was, uh, yeah, pretty good luck, I guess, kind of like rolling a 20-sided dice and getting a 20, and so, yeah, I got to go on this flight with a couple of the other Moondow members who helped coordinate the event. And then we had three astronauts on board actually as well. Uh, Doug Hurley, uh, Nicole Stott, and Charlie Duke. Um, all amazing astronauts with incredible stories. Uh, Doug was on the last space shuttle and the first um, Dragon capsule. Uh, Nicole, uh, her husband actually is a uh, uh, a teacher at the International Space University, and then 
Um, Charlie Duke was one of the Apollo 16 astronauts who literally drove the buggy around the moon and had all kinds of amazing stories about how they were having competitions to see who could jump the highest and he actually kind of like half fell over and the NASA's like knocked that off like uh, yeah they, you don't want to get caught uh, with a tear in your spacesuit or get knocked over because they had buggied out you know they were a mile, mile or two or whatever from their uh, ascent descent module and so yeah they kind of got back on their uh, mission you know everything was very well um, laid out for what they were supposed to do on the lunar surface and having jumping competitions was not something that the engineers uh, had planned. So um, yeah, we've uh, done a couple of other interesting things uh, with, the, with the $8 million. Um, we bought the two tickets, we, we gave some money to a co-working space. Uh, we've sponsored people to go to different conferences um, yeah, we're sponsoring the New Worlds Conference that Rick Tumlinson puts on uh, at the end of this, uh, beginning of November. So I might actually go down to, to that. Uh, I think we got like five or six tickets to the wall and the conference. And so, yeah, we're deciding who's going to go to that. Um, yeah, we helped fund the Space Generation Advisory Council in Baku. Uh, for their Space Generation Congress. Um, we have a number of scholarships out there for interns who wanna do uh, blockchain development uh, for the organization. Um, I'm trying to convince the organization to buy real estate in Boca Chica because I think it would be cool to have parties down there whenever they launch Starship and we could go watch it together and at the same time we could Airbnb it out uh, throughout the year and it would be a form of revenue. Uh, Cause yeah, a lot of these Web3 organizations, they have to have a business model. Otherwise, eventually all the money gets used up. And then if you don't have money, people don't tend to do as much, right? Um, yeah, uh, it always helps if, if, if volunteers can get paid for their work. Uh, they're much more inclined to do work. And so, yeah, we have a, a number of people who have been working and doing web development for our web page and, and things like that over the years who have been getting paid. Uh, and you can see how much they get paid because it's all publicly available on our blockchain. Um, we have switched chains a couple of times and that's actually helped with the organization. Uh, originally, we raised a bunch of money in ETH, Ethereum. And then we switched it over to a stable coin. For those who don't know what stable coins are, they're basically uh, tied to the dollar, where one stable coin is worth $1. And so we switched over from Ethereum to stable coin, and then Ethereum went way down, and then our stable coin was still at that level. And then a couple of years later, the stable coin that we had looked like it was maybe going to be unstable, like the people who were supposed to be keeping that reserve might not have that reserve. So then we switched back to Ethereum and then Ethereum went back up again. And so we've gotten pretty lucky timing those markets. Um, that doesn't always work. You know, people who have tried to do day trading in crypto usually uh, don't end up doing well. It's just, it's very difficult. The uh, crypto markets don't seem to follow the news. You would think if bad news comes out, it would go down and good news comes out, it goes up. I've been in the crypto space for 10 years now and it just doesn't seem to be the case. I don't, uh, sometimes there's events uh, that can make it go one way or another. When China had their big anti-crypto crackdown, there was definitely some market disruption then, but we're, you know, sometimes I read about good court cases that come out or bad court cases come out. The SEC is really kind of coming after the crypto industry pretty hard because there were people who took advantage. Uh, people who were selling snake oil where basically their token was a made up thing and they took a bunch of people's money and then split. And so that's uh, not good. We don't want that happening. At the same time, the SEC does have regulations in place so that you have to know who your customer is, right? Otherwise, 
if some terrorist organization is using you as an intermediary, that is really bad and you can get into very big trouble for that. And so now a lot of the crypto exchanges and different token uh, operators, they want to be compliant with the U.S. government and any government that, you know, that they're having to work with or any country that they're operating on, it's best to get some kind of license or have some kind of registered entity just so that you're compliant. Otherwise, um, you can get in pretty big trouble. Um, and so, yeah, I think I covered most of the points. Um, yeah, I guess I can open it up for, for questions uh, that people might have about Sure. Yep. Um, just like a general question about Moon Dow's vision for the future. So, like, what are their next major milestones? Are, are you trying to, you know, fund a moon colony? Like, what's the sort yeah, of yeah? Uh, depending on how far back you go and who you talk to in the Dow, some of the people are like, yeah, we're gonna have a moon party mm -hmm. in ten years. I think that's a little I, optimistic, right? NASA will be lucky to be <laughs> on the moon. I think uh, in a permanent way in 10 years um, you know anyone can in the community can propose something and then we ideate and talk about it and then uh, it goes up for vote on in the Senate that we have and then once the Senate passes it then it goes up to snapshot and then the whole community votes on it and then if it passes it passes and if it doesn't um, it gets kicked back down and sometimes you can re change it you know if the vote was close then you know, you can change a few minor details and then put it back up the vote and then, uh, yeah, and then it can change or get funded. Um, yeah, there is a process. Uh, the process has changed actually. We're on version six of our projects uh, process now, uh, but we do have um, a constitution. You know, it's a, a document that lays out how the organization is structured and if we we're going to change that, we actually have to vote on changing our constitution. So there is some structure to the way the organization operates. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think the big proposals that are up now. Uh, the most recent one was funding New Space or New Worlds. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're going to give them a couple thousand dollars and they give us a couple. You know, we're trying to build relationships with. Uh, as many space organizations as we can. And we, Pablo did release like a list of all the companies that we've worked with over the years. Uh, we have these town hall meetings where we have someone from um, industry come and talk, similar to the ISU Space Cafes, but yeah, we'll get, I don't know, Peter Beck or someone, you know, from the space industry who come and talk. And um, yeah, we are working with an org. Ah, one of the big ones I forgot was uh, an organization that is sending a payload to the moon. Um, they actually had um, some um, DNA on the last <coughs> Intuitive Machines lander where, um, man, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the organization we partner with, LifeShip. And LifeShip is, yeah, going to be sending additional little micro nano payloads you almost want to call them because they're so they're only a few grams but uh yeah we are going to send a few grams of uh information to the moon um uh in the coming years so yeah the, the people are always putting forth you know do we want to work with uh you know uh, a cubesat company um there are these decentralized science projects where we could fund people to develop something in an open source way. Um, that's where there's some overlap. But yeah, open source communities have been around for decades. You know, the Linux operating system, probably one of the most successful uh, open source projects um, where, yeah, you, you develop all of this technology kind of publicly, but then you never end up getting paid. Well, now with these DAOs, we can actually fund people and give prize money away for completing some kind of development. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the direction that we've been going. We still have, I think, eight or nine hundred thousand dollars in our treasury. It fluctuates, right? Because we're in Ethereum. Everything's been converted over to Ethereum now, and Ethereum prices 
uh, can fluctuate by 10 or 15 percent a day, um, depending on how turbulent uh, the stock market is. I do find that the, the more the stock market goes up and down, the more the crypto markets also go up and down. I think the correlation is because you have these um, um, stock um, structures, or, um, another three-letter acronym I'm drawing a blank on right now. Um, the volatility indexes. Yeah, the indexes. Um, uh, yeah, the, and um, and so yeah, those can affect the the crypto markets as well. Um, other questions? Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So were you going to talk about International Space University some? Maybe you could talk about. Oh yeah, I can talk yeah. about ISU. Like maybe about somewhere. what your what it's like to kind of go to school in France at the facility and maybe. You yeah, how sure thing. Is, like, uh, yeah, it's not Moondow related, but uh, I did have a really good experience when I went to ISU. I had never lived out. I had never traveled outside of the United States. I went to Canada when I was nineteen, but I had never been to Europe or anything like that. And so, yeah, I got my student visa to go study in Strasbourg, France for a year. Uh, really good experience. Uh, I had three uh, roommates and they all went to ISU. One of them was French, which helped out a lot. He found a really awesome apartment in downtown Strasbourg, uh, right across, you know, you could, I could look out and see this cathedral it's hundreds of years old. It was actually the tallest building in the world for like 150 years before the Eiffel Tower was created. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Although the bells would ring all day on Sunday, but that's the yeah, uh, price you pay, I guess. Um, yeah, living in France was interesting. All of our courses were in English, but they did offer a French course for those who wanted to try and learn a little bit of the language. My uh, French is pretty uh, mad, you know, it's not very good. Uh, but I did uh, pick up a little bit of French when I was there. Uh, we had, I think, about 43 students in our master's course. Uh, very diverse class. I think there was five Americans. Uh, we had six or seven Canadians. Uh, but then, you know, three French. We had um, one Chinese, one Japanese. Uh, two from India, one from Indonesia, uh, a couple from the Czech Republic, really all over the place, one from Turkey. And so, yeah, a really uh, good benefit of that is that whenever I travel abroad, I can usually, I know someone in that country and I can go call them up and, uh, you know, hang out with them and uh, figure out what they're doing because a lot of them are still working in the space industry. Getting into ISU is not the easiest thing in the world. It's, um, yeah, it's a master's program, so you do have to have a bachelor's, and they're pretty particular. Uh, I would say, um, not the majority, but maybe like 40% do have an aerospace engineering background, so you get a lot of really sharp people in the program, but they do try and get people from different disciplines. I had had a computer science background, and so I had some engineering, right? I took Health 3 and undergrad, but um, yeah, some people have law backgrounds, some people, we had a doctor um, from Argentina, I wanna say he was from, who was in our class. Um, yeah, just a very diverse group. Uh, at the time, uh, Dr. Nikolai Talarenko was running the master's program and he was actually from Russia and he still had his contacts. He worked on the Soviet lunar program and so our class got to take a field trip to Moscow and see the uh, cosmonaut training facilities in Star City. Uh, very cool. This was back in 2008, so the, you know, the political times were much better then. And so, yeah, our class got to go hang out on downtown Moscow for a week and uh, got a trip of Energia and uh, some of the universities, and it was a really, uh, pretty outstanding experience. Uh, we did other field trips to DLR, the German Space Agency. We got to go up to Aztec in the Netherlands and see their um, uh, ISS um, communication center. Uh, we saw Arion Space 
and outside of Paris, we, yeah, got to see where they were assembling this big Ariane 5 rocket, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I really, it was a life-changing experience. Um, yeah, there's probably all, I could talk about ISU for a long time, but that kind of, those were the, the highlights. <coughs> How do you become a, like a moon doll advocate? Do you have to like pay for it, or I can? Not um, you can join the Discord channel. That's where the mass majority of the communications goes on. <coughs> um, if you want to participate in the voting on the proposals, then you have to uh, purchase the Mooney token. Um, otherwise, if you do like a project, like I was saying, there's funding out there for these decentralized projects. You can actually earn your Mooney <coughs> as well. Um, yeah, I've earned a little bit of Mooney over the years uh, for doing various things for the organization, uh, but they, yeah, I encourage people to, there's a couple steps, Pablo is always trying to make the process of rolling people on easier, you know, it'd be ideal if it was just like two clicks, but there are a couple of steps involved which uh, can turn off people who are not techie or just uh, don't have the patience to follow three or four instructions. Um, but yeah, you can join the Discord channel for free. Uh, we do a little bit on Twitter too. If you just go to either Twitter or Instagram and type in Mudao, you can see what the organization is doing at least, and that keeps you privy to um, yeah uh, the projects that we're working on. How many women? Hmm? How many women are advocates in Mundal? There's a couple. So when I went on the Zero G flight, I won the NFT raffle, but we also voted uh, on two other people who would get to go, and we uh, two women won those. They were like uh, influencers. One's got kind of a pretty big following on uh, Instagram, and the other one's got a following. I think maybe also on Instagram. Uh, Instagram's pretty popular right now. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's uh, Coffee Crusher is her handle. Uh, she uh, is pretty regular on our Senate meetings. Um, yeah, for a while we didn't have so many and I did complain about not having diverse diversity in our gender, but we've We've got a couple uh, women that are pretty active now in the community, which is which is good. We want diversity. But like, what's the percentage versus men versus women? Um, probably fifteen percent, fifteen twenty. Fifteen. It's not great, right? And that's uh, a, a systemic problem throughout the aerospace industry. I actually published a paper. Five, year, five or six years ago for the International Astronautical Congress talking about the lack of women in our industry and how, I, how my company was trying to improve that by encouraging more minorities and, and women to get into the STEM fields and, and into aerospace in particular. Um, I think it's getting better. I mean, because if you go back to the Apollo era, there weren't hardly any, right? It was, uh, there were zero uh, astronaut women. Well, they had a cohort, but you know they were silent. None of them got to fly. I was trying to find that <coughs> woman, but <coughs> maybe she closed the Instagram. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for. Oh, just have one more question, yeah, just sure. about how you see. So, so. I'm interested in like blockchain as a governance model, right? You've, you've had some experience using blockchain to make distributed decisions in a community, and I'm interested, because in, in part of my work, I'm looking for maybe disruptions in like governance models used in space, and how that might impact how we do voting on Earth. Do you think there's a chance, like is this a fairly niche thing that you're doing with, with voting in blockchains in like a small community? Or do you see like in the blockchain community, 
people are kind of using that as like, we could scale this and like do something here in Arlington County and vote by a blockchain like in civil governments on Earth. Like, do you think there's a- Yeah, I think so. Uh, we're trying to find a good way of digitizing voting, right? Because people don't trust the voting machines very well. Uh, a lot of people are looking at blockchain as a way of verification of identity. Uh, there's a number of uh, companies and open source projects that want to use blockchain as a way of verifying a person. And that way you can also kind of keep your own credentials and, and take them with you. Um, and so, yeah, that's a very common theme uh, about building trust you know, um, on the blockchain. Um, yeah, the, uh, some of the things I feel like we're, you know, we're, have, we've been doing as a society for hundreds of years, you know, we come up with this thing, oh, it's new, and it's like, no, it's not really that new, we've been doing this for hundreds of years, we just digitized it. Um, but yeah, I do think that um, there's going to be more and more overlap between this digital world and the real world too, because um, you can't just have people creating a bunch of accounts online as well. You know, uh, when we do our votes, uh, we use quadratic voting. Uh, quadratic voting is where you kind of curve the people that have a lot of tokens. Otherwise, say a person had nine million Mooney, and there's a bunch of people that have 100,000. All of those people with 100,000 could vote for no, and then the one person with nine million could vote yes, and then just wipe out, out you know, all the voting of the, all the other people. So we use quadratic voting to kind of um, curtail that. So the person that has nine million gets rounded down to maybe, you know, a couple million, and the people that only have a hundred thousand get a little more power. Um, the issue with that is you need to make sure that when people create accounts, that they're real accounts, right? You don't have some bot account that created a thousand accounts with little amounts, because then they would have a huge amount of power. So we are we have implemented this thing called a Git coin passport where you have to link your uh, Mooney wallet to some kind of social media account uh, and that helps us verify and get rid of bad actors and you could set up you know a thousand bogus Twitter accounts and then a thousand bogus Mooney wallets but you really have to go through a lot of trouble um, to do that um, it wouldn't be impossible but uh, you're always going to have bad actors on the internet as well, but uh, yeah, I do think it's a way of conducting governance that's going to get more and more popular as people uh, understand how useful the technology is. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, I think there's uh, some more pizza in the back and some soft drinks, so feel free to, to, to linger. Thanks. Thanks.